Thanks, Rob, and the SAGES Program Committee for inviting me. And uh, while I'm a, an Army surgeon, I'm speaking for all of us who wear the uniform in this case. And I have uh, nothing to disclose other than I'm in the Army and that these thoughts and, and processes that uh, we're going to go through today are, um, are not representative of the Department of Defense, but certainly they... Uh, people are looking at these, as is SAGES and the military working group here. So, I'm going to start out simple and hopefully keep it simple as possible. But uh, this is what we do. These are the mottos. I didn't want to put the missions up here, but I think you can draw a line from these. You know, we're to take care of the soldiers, the troops their families and retirees and any beneficiary and anybody else who come, we come across, basically. And we're glad to do it. Next, what does this mean? Oh, go and do trauma care in support of our armed forces anywhere. What does that mean? Well, in the most austere places, most dangerous environments, most extreme weather conditions, That's Kandahar in 01. Oh, and not only trauma, but you're also going to go and take care of civilians and uh, children for non-traumatic illnesses. Advanced breast cancer, hemophilocele, and Ascaris. Oh, and you're going to set up a developing country's medical infrastructure or try to improve on what they've already got. This is laparoscopy in Kirkuk in 2003. Oh. And you'll only get a handful of people to do it. This is a split FST at Oregon E on the Pakistani border of Afghanistan. Not only that, but a lot of the time you're going to be sitting there doing nothing. In our first rotation in Kandahar and the Arabian Peninsula in 01, the number of days with no cases. And because sometimes you'll have some downtime and you don't have many people, you got to do 10 jobs. Sometimes you're the communications officer and the surgeon and the supply guy, and you go and help your first sergeant in your unit go and get whatever he needs to get done because there's a lot of competing resources out there or a lot of people competing for the limited resources in a constrained battlefield where you essentially have a landlocked country in both Iraq and Afghanistan for the most part. That guy there saying, where are the tents? Hmm. And occasionally you do get busy. And sometimes you don't know how busy you're going to be. And you have to be prepared to take on this, this trauma mission. So now that we've defined the problem, what next? What are the implied tasks of going and doing all this? Well, they are enormous, numerous, complex, detailed, and cross over all venues. The biggest thing, I think, is force protection, because if you can't protect yourself, don't go there. Logistics, if you can't supply yourself, don't go there. Then you got to, of course, be ready to do what you want to do, and that involves individual, individually, you got to be ready to do your job. The team's got to be ready to do their job, and then you got to be able to move the patients out of wherever you've been, or at least have a disposition on them, to somewhere where they'll be safe. And then there's more, so much more taking them from a place like Organy on the Pakistani border, treating them in a forward surgical team, and then the steps along the way. So now we'll focus a little on the individual tasks. This is really simple. What do we got to do? Well, we just got to go provide health care to service members and their families at home. That means doing our regular job. Then we're going to prepare to deploy. Tough, tough arena when you're getting ready to deploy because you don't know what you're going to come across. Each time you get deployed, at least from my experience, it's been different every time. Then you're going to deploy and provide health care to the service members downrange, redeploy, come home, and then get reintegrated back into your regular job. And repeat. Some of us many times over. So, 
This is a positive slide. I know it says lethal triad, but it is positive. We're going we're gonna to spin this in a positive direction because we're at SAGES, and SAGES is here to help us deal with the things that we're going to talk about here, uh, except for the, uh, the family time. That's a tough one. So this lethal triad of the military surgeon, uh, physician, nurse, medic, corpsman revolves around these things. Doing, working hard at home to keep your skills up, going and doing the, getting ready to deploy, and then coming, going out there and doing your job. There are certain interdiction points along here where I've placed some, ar some stars of where I think that, and you can place these anywhere. I mean, th this is just my, uh, some of what I thought of. Um, and I think that as far as trauma care goes, that number one, individual trauma care, we do pretty good at it now. Are we experts at trauma, all of us who are doing minimally invasive or oncology or um, breast surgery only? No, maybe not experts, but we certainly have a venue now over the last 10 years that we can use and a curriculum that, that in, uh, that's pretty stable that, um, uh, that, um, that works pretty well to get us to where we need to be. As far as the team training, skills maintenance while you're deployed and then the individual refresher training that you have to sort of go through or you have to go through some kind of a reset. What that is, is part of the discussion here. And of course the no family time is rampant. So pre-deployment training for trauma specifically, and there's other things we'll talk about here. There's a lot of stuff out there to do. Um, the keys aspects, and I'll get to this again, or I'll reiterate it, is to make it succinct and make it work and have some kind of measurable um, way to, um, um, to account for it all. The MSTCs are the medical simulation training centers at every post, Army post, and I think at uh, a lot of the Navy and the Air Force posts as well, that get the medics, the paramedics, the corpsmen, and, uh, and the... Um, Pararescue squadron, uh, uh, nurses, medics, and doctors all ready to go and do the, and keep their skills up on a continual basis. Then there's some at the teaching centers. We have some uh, simulation centers that help add to this training, as well as get our graduating residents, nurses, and uh, surgical technicians ready for their careers in the army. And then we've got the brigade combat tra trauma team training, which is in San Antonio. That's for not only brigade combat teams, but also hos combat support hospital personnel. The Army Trauma Training Center at Ryder in Miami is an excellent place for forward surgical teams to get training. It's a two-week course. I'll go into that in more detail. Then there, there are throughout the year, Adam Acid Emergency War Surgery Course, Extremity War Surgery Course, and Team Steps for the combat support personnel as well, and other teams as necessary. Sea Stars, the Air Force equivalent of all this, is an excellent program as well. They offer a similar uh, venue to the um, ATAC, but what they also do is provide a, a, a simulated platform, not quite like the jet fighter simulators that were on display yesterday, but they have vibrating and noisy uh, C-130 and C-17 mock-ups where they got to do patient care and you can't hear anything and it's vibrating and it's moving and it's a real challenge, but they get to do that in a simulated environment before deploying as well as update training. The Marines and the Navy have got the, have got the best thing going with this, uh, the cut suit thing, um, uh, thing done by a strategic, um, uh, the Strategic Operations Corporation. And unfortunately, I don't have a video of that, but they've really done an outstanding job with that. And of course, the first thing you start with is part task training. We felt that um, uh, that, the, that the hybrid model that Dr. Champion uh, pioneered or, or wrote about back in the, um, in the 90s applied to this. And so with focused didactic sessions leading up to park test trainers on inanimate objects and then some case-based scenarios, triage scenarios, leading to a controlled live tissue lab that's displayed here and then some in the field team training and uh, individual trauma training. We um, were able to get some brigade combat teams ready to go. Here they've got to move and notice how many people it takes to move these uh, mannequins. I mean, there's, there's six people there, six, seven people there moving these guys. 
and then we're moving into a simulated environment, which it's interesting. This is our uh, veterinarian facility at, um, at Fort Lewis, but it is a, uh, you can find yourself in any type of building structure downrange that you can find um, uh, to use as, the, as your shelter and uh, to your operating room. The Army Trauma Training Center in Miami is really the ultimate host nation integration experience. Remember that we are partnered in this war. We are partnered with so many other allies involved in this war on terror. And they are, um, uh, we've got to learn to use their equipment in some cases, learn their language, their protocols. Of course, the, with the Joint Trauma Training Center, the Joint Theater Trauma Registry and the um, uh, the clinical practice guidelines that come from that, uh, it's a lot easier now. These are some advanced tissue models for fasciotomy that Dr. Boyer and Al um, Buckman are working on. Excellent, what's that? Okay, uh, the, they're excellent um, models. And this is our burr hole training for general surgeons and orthopedic surgeons. This happens to be an orthopedic resident doing this burr hole. And then this all leads to the use of the giggly saw to get the craniotomy, the decompressive craniotomy going. Next, we are doing some, oh, let me go back. Uh, the, this is convoy operations at Joint Base Lewis McCord. Inside each of these trailers is a Humvee and they're all linked together in this control room. Um, what we do here is um, the, the people who use this is going to be a, a medical team is going to use this to go out and do a site survey of a local Afghani hospital or medical facility and they have to plan it. They have to plan for their own force protection. They have to come up with their own operations order or a plan and then they got to do the brief. And this film is going to be very quick, hopefully, and uh, that's why I'm explaining a lot of it to you ahead of time. They're basically going to go out, they're going to run into somebody. The guy is going to get mad at him, then they're going to get hit with an IED, and then they're going to start treating him, and then they'll, they'll start uh, uh, transitioning out of the trailers and into medical care due to safety factors. So. It's all done through a movie eight displays coming around the whole thing, 360. There's the IED, taking care of the casualties, moving outside. And then, in case this ever happens and you have a rollover, You hear him yelling? It's not because they're on a roller coaster or anything. They're actually yelling, roll over, roll over, roll over, in case they didn't know. I don't, I don't, that's just one of the things that, uh, that uh, we emphasize communication. And so uh, in this case, this is what they got to do. So they roll and they roll and they roll. And then um, the key thing is they're going to wind up upside down here. And then they've got to exit the vehicle. In exiting the vehicle, you don't know which way is up, and it's tough to get to your seat belt, release handle, with all your equipment on. So they've made some cutaways or some, uh, some special knives that are specifically designed to cut that, uh, that seat belt when you get out. And you'll see all kinds of people falling on their heads as they get out. This group did a pretty good job. I oh, couldn't get his foot out though. That's a problem. Good, out in success. Now, in this one, you got to remember that this particular exercise is in the afternoon. But all morning they've been planning this, starting with a safety briefing in the morning and a communication powwow. What does that communication powwow consist of? what they're going to talk about and what are the hand signals because in this one you can turn this up too if you want you can hear the helicopter and what this is going to do th this is a mobile surgical team in honduras and we're we're trying to uh, practice taking our team out to a um, a disaster relief zone because you can't get there because the roads are out 
Next. We did a survey, 1,500, um, um, yeah, okay. The, the surgeons um, went ahead and uh, answered our survey and they said that there were a bunch of, um, um, uh, of uh, trauma skills, of course, they got better at while they were deployed. Of course, there are many places where we can interdict here, both in the pre-deployment, deployment, post-deployment post setting. Um, the interdiction points are that we have to focus on common curriculum, emphasize the jointness of this. We have to use evaluation tours, park test training leading up to capstone events, and then we got it. once we do it, we have to decide, are we gonna master it? Or are we gonna actually tell people they're not deploying because you didn't meet the standard or not? That's gonna be a tough one. And then, of course, um, getting back to this, the individual refresher training. Of course, when we went all and deployed, and uh, did all this trauma training or nothing, we came back and our skills were worse, we felt. Or is this just a confidence problem? We gotta try to measure this decrement and that'll be the next portion of this study. Most people felt that the time to regain clinical skills was about three to six months. So what are we gonna do here? Refresher training or just do the work? And then are we gonna regulate that? Of course, SAGE is big into this already and I think that they are gonna be the big help that we're gonna need. Um, as far as par parallel, parallel applications to this, who else cycles? Lots of people, MCERT teams, disaster relief teams, the global surgery departments at universities who do hum humanitarian care for two weeks to six month rotations, rural surgeons, research sabbatical um, uh, surgeons and professors, updates on introduction of new techniques, maternity leave and part-time surgeons. Of course, our path forward, it's challenging, it's hard work, but we've got to measure this decrement. Is it confidence or is it actual a skills decrement, technical skills decrement, or a cognitive decrement? Thanks. Thank you very much, Rob.